one very actionable protocol that was told to me by all the dental professionals I spoke to was use a soft Chances are, if you're like most people out there, simply because you don't have the latest information on what oral health really is and how to best support it, you are disrupting your oral health in ways that are depleting other aspects of your brain and bodily health. And I'm not here to scare you, I'm just here to tell you that there's some additional things that you can do and a few things to avoid doing that very likely will improve your overall bodily health very quickly. Health Lab. Okay, let's talk about oral health this absolutely critical aspect of not just having fresh, bright teeth and no cavities and fresh breath, or at least lack of bad breath, one would hope, but also total body health. Oral health is inextricably linked to all aspects of brain and bodily health, both in the short term and in the long term. And it is perhaps the most overlooked aspect of mental health and physical health. Chances are you are doing things to really deplete and disrupt your oral health. That's right, even if you're paying a lot of attention to tooth health, chances are, if you're like most people out there, simply because you don't have the latest information on what oral health really is and how to best support it, chances are you are doing things that yes, might be keeping your teeth white and clean and you're not getting cavities, but you are disrupting your oral health in ways that are depleting other aspects of your brain and bodily health. And I'm not here to scare you, I'm just here to tell you that there's some additional things that you can do and a few things to avoid doing that very likely will improve your overall bodily health very quickly. And the good news is those things are also zero or low cost or in some cases can save you substantial cost. Let's talk about how cavities form because I think this is the major question that people ask when asking about or thinking about oral health. No specific food, not even sugar, causes cavities. Cavities are not caused by sugar. Cavities are caused by bacteria that feed on sugar. And now that's not just a little bit of a twist in the mechanism, that's a critical point. There's no specific food not even pure sugar, not even like a hard candy, like a delicious Jolly Rancher. I used to like those when I was a kid. They get stuck in your tooth that causes cavities. No, it's the bacteria that feed on sugar that then produce acid that burrows down through, that degrades, that demineralizes the tooth in this very focal area that we call a cavity, okay? Now, if that isn't surprising enough, get this, the bacteria that causes cavities by eating sugar and releasing this acid, while there are several of them, the major one is called streptococcus mutans, or what I'll call strep mutans for short. Strep mutans is not something you're born with. It's actually a communicable bacteria. That's right, you give it to one another. Through how? Sharing of glasses, sharing of bottles, kissing on the mouth, Etc. Now I am not here to tell you not to do any of those things. I'm certainly not here to tell you that. So the key thing to understand here is that cavities form not from foods, not from sugars per se, but from strep mutans and other bacteria that eat those sugars and create acid. Hence the critical need to keep your mouth as alkaline as possible, which does not mean that you can never drink some lemon water or coffee or tea. Here's the key point that everyone needs to remember because this dovetails beautifully into how often you should brush and floss. Cavities have the opportunity to form is dependent on the amount of time, the amount of time in which your mouth is net acidic or net alkaline, the amount of time that you are in a demineralization mode or remineralization mode. Okay, so it's the amount of time. No one, no one can avoid having their mouth be acidic every once in a while or ingesting a sugar or a food that strep mutans can feed on and produce acid. The key is to try and reduce the amount of strep mutans and reduce the amount of acid in the mouth. That's the best way to reduce cavities and even reverse cavities that have started to form. Before we get into the to do's, I think it's very important to discuss the do nots that every dentist and periodontist I spoke to agreed on. The quick list, as I'll call it, of bad for your teeth, bad for your mouth, and therefore bad for your brain and body are alcohol, stimulants, smoking, vaping, sugar, acidic foods, acidic drinks, but many of us, most of us can't avoid any sugars, any acidic foods. The other things can be avoided, but some of us are prescribed these drugs and need these drugs. Some people like a drink with alcohol in it every once in a while and it's perfectly fine for them, or they've deemed it perfectly fine for them. 
In that case, try and rinse the mouth, try and keep the milieu of the mouth as moist and as basic or alkaline rather, less acidic as possible. So to translate this a bit more to the real world, if you're somebody like me who loves tea, you don't wanna sip on those sorts of things all day and you don't wanna sip on them for hours and hours. And if you're going to combine those things with some acidic foods or with any kind of food, you know, try and get your meals done, wrap them up and rinse your mouth and move to the next part of your day. So now let's take ourselves back to being little kids, right? When we were taught to brush our teeth in a particular way, you know, you're supposed to spend a certain number of minutes, set a timer, you're supposed to floss in a certain way. Every time we go to the dentist, they tell us to floss in a certain way, do this, not this. What do the data really say? What are the modern health professionals in dental and oral health really suggesting we do when it comes to brushing and flossing? So now let's talk about what correct brushing and flossing really is. One very actionable protocol that was told to me by all the dental professionals I spoke to was use a soft toothbrush. Now this one hurts, or I suppose hurts less. Anyway, it hurts my heart a little bit because I enjoy very much using a medium or hard toothbrush and really like scrubbing back there, especially in the teeth in the back. It just feels good. I feel like I'm doing something good. I get into the backs of the teeth, the fronts of the teeth. But every single one of them said that that very vigorous brushing with medium or hard, as they're called, bristles really disrupts the interface between the teeth and the gums in ways that's not healthy for the gums and actually makes tenting of the gums and those pockets, those recesses as they're called, far more likely to form. And every single one of them said, if you are regular with your brushing, and especially if you're brushing and flossing regularly, that a soft toothbrush, that is one that's moved in a circular motion on the fronts and backs of your teeth for all your teeth, and that is gentle, you're not providing a lot of pressure, is going to be the best way to break up that biofilm layer each and every time and promote the best tooth and overall oral health. Now, what about flossing? There's a little bit of debate about flossing in the dentistry field. Some people say, if your gums bleed when you floss, you need to floss more. In fact, most dentists I spoke to said that but they also emphasize that you need to floss correctly. You can't just pull the floss down onto the gum in between the tooth. You need to glide down the side of the tooth, get a little bit underneath the gum and use a circular motion and then lift up from between the two teeth. Flossing is a great idea for tooth health and that if your gums bleed when you floss correctly, as I just described what correct flossing is, that your best strategy is to floss at least twice a day between all of your teeth. And if you're not gonna floss twice a day for whatever reason, in protest or for lack of time, at least once a day, and when would that once a day be? It would be at night before going to sleep. And several dentists I spoke to said that using a water pick is going to be better than using more typical floss or for you or using those toothpick based floss approaches because it's gentler on the teeth. I personally have not used a water pick, but I'm sort of intrigued by the, the concept because it sounds like it's um, much harder to damage the gums and teeth by doing it and that it is at least as efficient as standard flossing. One of the key protocols that I'd like to discuss is the use of an artificial sugar called xylitol. Xylitol is a very low calorie sweetener. I can place it among the other low calorie sweeteners like aspartame, sucralose, stevia, et cetera. But what's unique about xylitol is that very much like standard sugar or any kind of carbohydrate sugar, the bacteria Streptococcus mutans loves to eat xylitol. But when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it doesn't, meaning it cannot produce the acid that normally would demineralize the teeth and create cavities. In addition to that, when Streptococcus mutans eats xylitol, it kills Streptococcus mutans. So what this means is that if xylitol is present in the oral cavity after a meal, say in the minutes and hours after a meal, then any strep mutans that happens to be there is going to preferentially feed on the xylitol, not other sugars, and it won't be able to release acid. And because xylitol can actually inhibit the growth and that is the proliferation of more strep mutans. We've got a twofer. We've got a situation where strep mutans can't release acid to demineralize the teeth and potentially cause cavities. And the total amount of strep mutans that can grow, that can proliferate in what are called colonies, well, then that can't happen. So xylitol is a very potent tool for improving oral health in this way. 
In addition, xylitol reduces inflammation of the gum tissue and other soft tissues of the mouth. And so xylitol is providing an array of positive benefits, especially when it's present in the mouth immediately after meals. So if you're somebody who wants to explore the use of xylitol gum or xylitol mints after a meal, I wouldn't suggest going from consuming zero xylitol mints to consuming 50 a day or something like that, or even 10 a day. You might start off slowly and just consume one or two after a meal, maybe just your morning meal, maybe just your evening meal something of that sort, rather than chewing xylitol gum all day long, et cetera, et cetera.